brave singer, activist, icon. Sinead O'Connor is one of the most well-known singers of the 80s, well-loved for her authenticity and extraordinary connection with her audience. Known for her iconic shaved head, Sinead O'Connor started her music career when she was discovered by a local drummer in Ireland. When I was younger, I had a different platform from which I wrote songs. I had stuff to get off my chest, like whatever, you know. Um, I suppose once I got that all off my chest, like, I was able to become the songwriter I would have been otherwise, you know. By creating emotional and soulful performances, she amazed audiences worldwide. Throughout her career, her wonderful voice powered emotional hits dealing with heartbreak, trauma, sex, and politics. But behind her iconic appearance, there was a vulnerable soul, scarred by her life's trials. No, I mean, the, the job of a singer and a songwriter is to be emotionally open, and we, that's what music does. It, it says the things that there aren't words for that people can't otherwise express, so it would be um, kind of ludicrous not to be open, yeah. Although her life was often surrounded by controversy, Sinead remains one of the most remarkable voices of the 80s. Her song, Nothing Compares to You, is one of the most stunning performances of the early 90s. Her battles with mental health and personal struggles became intertwined with her artistry. After her sudden passing in July of 2023, the echo of her voice will forever linger in the hearts of those who listen to her music. Sinead was born in Dublin, Ireland on the 8th of December 1966. She discussed her difficult childhood publicly multiple times. Her parents got divorced early on, and her mother was frequently abusive towards her and her siblings for years on end. After Sinead was caught shoplifting at the age of 15, her mother took the drastic decision to send her to reform school, where she spent 18 months. During her time there, she focused on her development with writing and music, but she was also terrified of the imposed conformity. Sinead said that she had never experienced such terror and agony. When she turned 18, her mother died in a car crash. Sinead often opened up about her mother's death and her emotions in relation to it. Without even thinking, what do you love about your mother? The first thing that came to my mind actually is that she did, which is a very strange thing to come to mind, but I love her about my mother that she did. I think it was very kind of her. Although I miss her horribly, I really ache for her, and I think that's part of where my suicidal instinct comes from, is that I want my mother. But I cannot wait until the day that I naturally get to heaven so that I can see my mother again. Her music career began when she was discovered by the drummer of the popular Irish band In Tuanua and co-wrote their hit song Take My Hand.
Before finishing school, O'Connor ran away to Dublin, where she sang and played guitar on the street and in pubs and worked for a singing telegram service. I think it's okay for women to have lots to say. Oh, I do too. Uh, you know, sometimes people criticise you for having a lot to say, but they shouldn't sit you in front of anything and ask you questions, you know, that's, I suppose, you know. But what I meant about when I was younger was I grew up in an extraordinarily abusive situation in the 70s Ireland, and that, there was no such thing as therapy. So what I meant about having stuff to say at that time, writing from the previous platform, was um, really I was trying to get off my chest a lot of grief, you know. Um, You're obviously in a much happier I, uh, place When it now. comes to spiritual stuff, A, you should never ask an Irish person to talk about religion <laughs> unless you're going to be there for 100 years. But when it comes to spiritual matters, I'm a person who really uh, is in a, a relationship with the Holy Spirit that is really important to me and that I consider is where I got music from. In the same way as Lee Perry believes that music is the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm the same, you know. So uh, the only thing I've ever ranted on about in my life uh, has been child abuse, actually, and or respect the Catholic Church, respect in the Holy Spirit, so um, I'm not inclined to kind of rant on about anything else, if you like, other than through music, you know. O'Connor attracted the attention of the two owner-managers of a small London record label named Insign Records while playing with the Dublin band Ton Ton Makoot. Her time as a singer for Ton Ton Makoot brought her into the spotlight of the music industry, and she was eventually signed by Insign Records. She also teamed up with an experienced manager, and soon after she was signed, she embarked on her first major project, working on the vocals for the song Heroin, which she co-wrote with U2's guitarist The Edge for the soundtrack of the film Captive. The Lion and the Cobra, Sinead's debut album, was released in late 1987. The result was one of the most acclaimed debut records of 1987, with a pair of alternative radio hits in the singles Mandinka and Troy. Almost from the outset of her career, however, O'Connor was a controversial media figure in interviews following the LP's release, she defended the actions of the IRA, resulting in widespread criticism from many corners, and even burned bridges by attacking longtime supporters of U2. Nonetheless, she remained a cult figure prior to the release of 1990's chart topping I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got, a harrowing masterpiece sparked by the recent divorce from drummer John Reynolds. The complexity of O'Connor's songs was praised by critics who also acknowledged the song's unmistakably non-commercial nature. They also praised her passionate and strong voice. The album eventually sold more than 500,000 copies and was certified platinum despite not having any significant hit singles. The album rocketed to the top of the Billboard charts and earned O'Connor four Grammy Award nominations including Best Album, Best Song, Best Female Vocalist, and Best Alternative Album. Thanks to the phenomenal success of the smash hit single, Nothing Compares to You, which was originally a song written by Prince and first recorded by a band called The Family. In 1991, O'Connor was selected Artist of the Year by Rolling Stone. When you look back, because you say it's been nearly 20 years since yeah. the album was released, when you look back over those 20 years, what can you pick out as highlights for you, personal highlights? Janice yeah, to be a lint of them, probably far too many to, you know, but obviously the nothing compares to you thing was a big one, you know. Yeah. Well, you say it so, oh, the nothing compares to you thing. Well, <laughs> it was huge. Yeah. <laughs> but um, is there anything that you, dare I say, regret, or do you just see as, you know, what happens happens, you can't change the past? What's your no, view on life? I don't regret anything about it, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
It was no, great. Right. Like I had a great trip, you know. Mm. So. Yeah. The music video for Nothing Compares to You won the MTV Award for Video of the Year. She performed a cover of You Do Something to Me to the Red Hot Organization's Cole Porter tribute AIDS fundraiser album Red Hot and Blue in 1990. I get the, the album as well. It seems like it's a very personal album to yeah. you in particular. Yeah. I mean, talk me through that. It seems like a very emotional, from, you know, stories that are very, very close to you, you right. know, by your own um, circumstances and right. what's happened to you in your life. Would right. you say that's true? Yeah, it was a very personal record, yeah, which I suppose all records are, really. I suppose that's that's all songs are pretty personal, really, when you think about it. But Yeah. If you had to pick a track on the album that was your favourite, if you could, what, what would it be? Hmm. Give me, give me a look at the... Do you want to look? Try and remember what songs You're an album. Here we go. I know. <laughs> it's been a long time. There you go. Let me see... It'd probably be nothing compares. Really? Yeah, I mean, I like a lot of the other songs as well, but if I had to, if you said pick one, I'd yeah, I'd pick that. Yeah. Okay, but why? You know, why would you say that that was the track that appeals to you? Consider it was written by someone else. Yeah, but I mean, just a, I just feel the song very strongly. Do you mm. know what I mean? I identify with it, which I'm sure loads of people do. Do you know mm. what I mean? It's an intriguing point, isn't it, with an artist like you who's developing over the years and still developing, that you have a track like Nothing Compares to You, which is, is, is an iconic track, an anthemic track, very much for you. When you listen to it, do you still think that means something very special to me or that was of another time? Because it is the first track, not the only one, but it's the first one that most people will remember. Yeah, I know I love the track. I have the same emotional connection with it every every time I sing it. Or I don't really listen to it as such because you don't really listen to your own records after they've come out. You know what I mean? Otherwise, you've got worries. You know? <laughs> but, um, I think Krista Berg still listens to Lady in Red. In fact, yeah, I know yeah. it for a fact because he told us the other day. No, it's a bit Miss Haversham, <laughs> isn't it, to be sitting here <laughs> listening to your own records. So I don't really listen to it, but I have to sing it, obviously, a lot. And I, I, I love singing. I, I always have the same kind of connection with it. Or whatever. Red, Hot and Blue was followed by the release of Am I Not Your Girl. The album was unfortunately a commercial disappointment. Frank Sinatra vowed to kick her in the ass after she said she would not perform if the United States national anthem was performed before one of her shows in 1990. She withdrew her name from consideration after getting four Grammy Award nominations. She did not attend the awards event despite winning the Brit Award for International Female Solo Artist. She also shared vocals on the single Blood of Eden and gave background vocals to the song Come Talk To Me from Peter Gabriel's studio album Us in 1992. In May 1993, Gabriel extended an invitation for her to take part in his ongoing Secret World Tour, where she would perform a variety of songs on a lavish stage. O'Connor travelled and gave guest performances. In September of 2003, the double album She Who Dwells was released. It included rare and unreleased studio tracks, as well as live material from the previous year. In 2005, she had numerous collaborations with other artists, sometimes featuring on their records. Later that year, Throw Down Your Arms was released, which embodied a collection of reggae classics by artists like Burning Spear, Peter Tosh and Bob Marley. This compilation managed to reach number four on Billboard's Top Reggae Albums chart. She then returned to the studio the following year to work on her first album of new material since the release of Faith and Courage. How, how old are your kids now? Uh, my eldest is 22, uh, my next is 13, and my next is 5, and my next is 2. Wow. So, yeah. So you're quite busy. You get your yeah, hands full very, as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how do they feel about, um, well, the oldest, the eldest, mum back out on stage again? Oh, uh, they don't mind, they don't mind. As long as I don't bring them to any of the gigs or anything, they don't like coming to gigs and really? that freaks them out. So, oh. Yeah. Oh, well, because they're so used to me just being their mum, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. They get freaked out when they see this other thing that you are, you know? Yeah. yeah. 
course, seems to be strange. So I kind of keep them out of it. Any of them musically inclined? Yeah, all of them, yeah. Oh, Very okay. much so. Yeah. Was that something you felt quite important to...? No, I don't push them into it at all. I, I've never pushed them into it. In fact, I'd probably discourage them, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But they're, they're all into it. But it's in the so. blood, what can you yeah, do? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Aside from the release of her 1997 single, Gospel Oak, O'Connor's recording career fluctuated in the late 1990s, eclipsed by the turmoil going on in her private life. In 1995, an extended custody battle began between O'Connor and her ex-lover, Irish journalist John Waters, over their newborn daughter, Roisin. Deeply hurt by Waters' bitter accusations that she was not fit to be a mother, O'Connor attempted suicide in March 1999. While recovering, O'Connor agreed to let Roisin live with Waters in Dublin. A few days later, however, she took away her daughter from her father and flew back to London. Yeah, I wanted to, I want to ask you the question about image as well, because it's something that's intrigued me. We're talking about music and, and, and the work, as it were, over that period of time. But your image changed very fundamentally at one point in your life, the short hair which you still have and so on and so forth. Right. Was that just something that you felt was a better way of expressing where you were coming from or was there pressure on you? Why? It's a pretty radical thing to have done. Well, I, it's stuck. I guess I was always playing with my hairdo anyway, like girls do, I suppose, and it was getting shorter and shorter. This was around the time I was kind of 19. I, I had not a mohawk, but it was all shaved there and it was yeah. kind of a little bit there. and I, um, in the end, my manager said, oh, I think you should shave it kind of thing. But but also, uh, it, that coincided with my record company trying to get me to grow my hair really long and wear short skirts and stuff like that. So they just the two happened at the same time. And I thought, oh, sure, I'll get rid of it. Because I, I suppose, you know, I, I like, I think it looks better on me. I don't really suit hair, believe it or not. Even my kids, recently I did grow my hair. In fact, I got extensions and everything. And my kids went mad and said, no way, like they look <laughs> short. They much prefer it short, you know. So I just feel like me with it short. And, and we know from our own experience, they are your most honest yeah, critics, yeah. are they not? Yeah, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Sinead later had three children, son Jake with her first husband John Reynolds, son Shane with Irish trad musician Donal Lunny, and son Yeshua with Frank Bonadio. In 2010, Sinead got married once again, this time to her friend and collaborator Steve Cooney, but their relationship didn't last. They broke up the following spring. Sinead then married a fourth time, she and Barry Herridge tied the knot in Las Vegas in December of 2011, but 18 days after she announced that the marriage was over. O'Connor was becoming famous for her controversial public outbursts. Even more publicly surrounded, a 1992 performance by O'Connor on Saturday Night Live, during which she tore up a photo of Pope John Paul II denouncing the Catholic Church as the real enemy. We find it necessary. We know we will win. We have confidence in the victory of good over Fight the real enemy. It, the priest isn't the ones that need to be dealt with. It's the so-called sane people who covered up the cover-ups of the cover-up, and they're still covering up the cover-ups of the cover-ups. One person you cannot cover up in front of is the Holy Spirit. These people acted like in the per living presence of the Holy Spirit. They lied and covered up the rapes of children. They're disres they either don't believe in the Holy Spirit or they don't respect it. They therefore, anybody who is involved in that cover-up doesn't have the right to say that they represent the Holy Spirit and run any church or to say that they represent Christ. So it's a matter of great importance that we have a church that's run by people who actually respect the Holy Spirit. You know? Despite her contempt for the clerical hierarchy and to bring attention towards allegations of child abuse within the institution, O'Connor maintained she was a Catholic and devoutly spiritual. 
It's not the man, obviously. It's the office and the symbol of the organization that he represents. I consider them to be responsible for the destruction of entire races of people and the subsequent existence of domestic and child abuse in every country they went into, the singer stated in a 1992 interview with Time magazine. The Anti-Defamation League condemned O'Connor. So did Madonna and Phil Hartman. Conservative groups steamrollered her records, and when actor Joe Pesky hosted SNL the following week, he threatened to smack her. Two weeks later, O'Connor was booed at a tribute concert for Bob Dylan, signaling the end of one phase of her career and the start of another. Well, here, here's where I'm coming from and not wishing any badness to the man. I, I don't know anything about him. I, 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 as far as I'm aware, he's had nothing to do with any of the child abuse business. So, you know, I don't have any bone to pick with him. But I have a bone to pick with, here's the thing, when he changes what I'm now going to tell you, then I will believe that they're serious about reforming their attitude toward children. The, no, there are, uh, on their website, this is listed by the way, there are 10 excommunicable, excommunicable crimes a Catholic can commit. The two equal number ones, there's only number one has two, in this order are female ordination and paedophilia. Okay, now the construction of that sentence is very dodgy. At, at very least, they should swap them around. In other words, it's showing you what they think of children. They're comparing the rape of children to something as petty as a woman going and getting ordained. So they should either remove, you know, altogether the reference to female ordination, or personally, as a female priest, I'd That's be happy. I'd that. be happy yeah. if they just reverse the order. It looks really bad, and I don't know if it's that he hasn't seen this or what. But to be fair, I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But to have that as your number one in this day and age after all the reports and even the paedophilia not come first. It looks like they still don't care about children and that's worrying to me. I will believe that the day that that sentence is switched around and it says that the most grievous crime a Catholic can commit is paedophilia and then female ordination, that's fine, I don't agree with that, but to have it as your number one, that female ordination and then paedophilia, to compare the two, it's a good, clever in the church are great at this kind of semantics and messing with your head, because the women get all up in arms and go, why can't we be ordained? But actually, no, that sentence is about what we think of children, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't believe a word of any reform or anything else until that is switched around. Almost becoming a virtual pariah by then, Sinead reported her retirement from the music industry, although later it was claimed that her return to Dublin had the purpose of studying opera. She was away from the public scene for the next few years, taking part in a theatrical production of Hamlet and later on touring with Peter Gabriel. Although by the mid-90s she had stopped making hit records, she never stopped making music. Sinead kept writing her own songs, but in addition, she restyled Irish folk music, reggae and religious music. She brought her unique sensibility to music made famous by other artists, artists' collaborations and film soundtracks. Over the years, tabloid culture was obsessed with O'Connor's creative and personal moves and choices. These often involving explorations of spirituality and sexuality, personal trauma, and sometimes public controversial takes. I don't really actually feel like I'm a feminist. It's not that I'm not either and not, not that I have any problem with feminism or whatever I just have a problem with isms and is really of any labels kind. yeah of any kind so no it's not a feminist album at all and if anything you know hardcore feminists might say perhaps the opposite because it's a romantic album it's all love songs and it's all you know there there are four female characters on the record apart from myself obviously and um, they're all very romantically engaged they're all love songs and you know one of them's quite obsessed with this one particular guy that she's singing to the whole time so it's not really terribly feminist when at the end of the day but I liked the campaign because more as a female boss in the music industry, as you may know, male and female artists, we really get treated like we're working for the people who are working for us. That's mm -hmm. the way it runs. And um, that can be exaggerated when you're female. And I often had over the years issues around being, um, you know, heard really as a boss, you know. 
um, like you'd ring up your accountant looking for documents and they'll tell you you don't need them, stuff like that, you know, just stupid stuff like that. So um, I was inspired by the campaign as a boss, I was able to take a certain amount of power as a boss that I would have been um, afraid to take before because you always don't want to hurt anyone's feelings and all that kind of stuff, you know. So. I will meet you later in somebody's office. In 2014, Sinead released another great album, I'm Not Bossy, I'm the Boss. She appeared on the cover wearing a wig and figure-hugging black dress while caressing a guitar. It's cathartic insofar as I would call myself a Stanislavski method singer slash songwriter. That's, that's what we do, or that's what I do, and um, you're in a different character every, every three minutes, and it's cathartic from one... It, it isn't in one sense because it's not your experience that you're expressing. It's not anything you particularly need to express. It is from the point of view of fun. It's great fun, and perhaps you can go further with characters than you would otherwise. A bit like being a puppet master, you know? Um, but I wouldn't necessarily, I'd say it's more uh, fun than anything else, but what's, what I like about it is that I'm from the 70s where albums had really, a, a, it wasn't about singles, it was a journey, mm -hmm. and the character was usually on a journey, whether the character was the actual songwriter, like in the case of Bob Dylan, uh, Blood and the Tracks being a great example, or whether it was characters that someone invented. So I quite like the idea now of um, almost trying to create a bit of a, mu a play, but with music, you know what I mean? And you can plot ahead and use characters to tell a particular story that isn't yours, as such. But at the time of the release, her mental health was still precarious. In November of the following year, while recovering from surgery, she posted a message on platforms announcing that she was in an Irish hotel and that she was contemplating suicide. Fortunately, she was found well and received the treatment she required. What I did observe um, in the last 24, 36 hours was that the coverage, and I've noticed it here in England before, there was a guy, was it Jack Speed? Uh, there was, I can't remember if that's his name, forgive me if it's not, but there was a football guy, player or manager who I believe had tried to take his life a couple of times. And the co I don't know if he succeeded or not, or, you know, um, and I hope this is an offensive conversation, but the coverage, the media coverage of that, and also I thought yesterday of Robin Williams was interesting to me because um, it was very compassionate and coverage of f well known females who have had mental illness or suffered from depression is notoriously abusive. Um, and I was hoping, I, I hope that one of the things that might come out of this is that the coverage of, for example, female celebrities like Britney Spears, Britney Spears, um, Amanda Bynes, other females that have had issues, you know, they get lynched in the streets by photographers, they get mocked and buffooned. And when f males are, are in the public eye are dealing with the same thing, the coverage is much more compassionate as it should be, you know. Because when you look at someone like Lindsay Lohan, she's probably a prime example of Precisely, that. Precisely, you know. now a laughing star. Well, exactly, going through you know what I mean? I, and I've gone through that myself, do you know what I mean? And it's, it's really appalling. So, uh, uh, you know, that's one of the observations I've made. And I hope that perhaps that's something that can be discussed in days to come when, you know, the debate can, can safely, without, without disrespecting anyone, become about how these things are covered, you know. In 2018, she took the decision to convert to Islam and changed her name to Shahada Sadaqat, but she kept Sinead O'Connor as her artist's name when she was performing. In Islam, you don't call it conversion, you call it reversion. The idea is that you were born Muslim in the first place. That if, you know, any, any person with any logic would realize they were Muslim all along. So that's actually what happened to me. I've been a theologian all my life, studying theology. But I never thought that I would join any particular religion. But because I grew up in a theocracy, I was very interested in theology. So I studied all the different religions. And I actually left Islam to last because I had such a huge amount of prejudice about it, actually, you know?
In June of 2021, she released a memoir titled Rememberings and she took part in a press campaign to promote it. Unfortunately, some of the interviews she took part in left her anxious. The singer declaring that she felt badly triggered by an interview on BBC Radio 4 when talking about her mental health struggles and the media's coverage of the situation. On 4th June 2021, O'Connor announced her immediate retirement from the music industry. While her final studio album, No Veteran Dies Alone, was due to be released in 2022, O'Connor stated that she would not be touring or promoting it. Posting the news on Twitter, this is to announce my retirement from touring and from working in the record business. I've gotten older and I'm tired, so it's time for me to hang up my nipple tassels. Having truly given my all, NVDA in 2022 will be my last release, and then there'll be no more touring or promo. A few days later, she argued against the statement and announced it was an impulsive reaction to an insensitive interview, and she was still going ahead with her already scheduled tour of 2022. Another shock came for Sinead in January of 2022, when her 17-year-old son, Shane, who was under suicide watch, escaped the institution and took his own life. After this incredibly painful loss, she posted a series of concerning tweets, hinting that she was also contemplating suicide and announcing she had been admitted into a hospital. On the 26th of July, 2023, Sinead's family announced her death at the age of 56. They declared their devastation and requested privacy from the public. She was, in many ways, the best of us. She was one of those difficult people who refuse to be silent. She was a difficult woman. woman, And by God, uh, uh, we need difficult women. We need difficult people to speak out. And she did so in, in quite extraordinary ways. Like nobody else. It is astonishing what she did. It really is. I mean, like Sinead got involved in certain things to do with religion that I thought where is she going now? She was a priest one day and a nun the next, etc. But some of the things she actually did, some of the barriers she broke down, some of the sort of no regrets in terms of what she was saying, it turned out to be, as I say, quite prescient. It turned out to be just true and people weren't ready to listen to it at first. I mean, Sinead was just completely and absolutely one of a kind. She was absolutely amazing, really talented. You mentioned 10 albums. Some of the albums in the middle were slightly dodgy, I thought, but the first few, and in particular the last two, absolutely brilliant. She went back to some great pop music with the last few, and she also has an album ready to go as well with the Belfast musician David Holmes. Um, but also, in between times, I mean, Sinead was just her own person. She would never have anything like regret or anything like that. It was always to do with her own ambition and success. And there was a depravity there. If you read her, her, her autobiography, it's quite frightening some of it, but there's redemption through the whole thing. She doesn't need anybody to tell her anything. She trailblazer and um, one of a kind. Um, when I was a child and I heard Nothing Compares to You, it stuck with me. Iconic woman in music, actually. Someone really to look up to and be inspired by. Um, as an activist myself and as a woman growing up in Ireland, I completely resonate with her uh, lyrics and her artistry uh, about oppression. And also, um, I'm inspired uh, by her legacy of activism. 
quite a surreal situation when Sinead O'Connor just walked into the pub at an open mic night. What, what happened next? This lady arrived carrying a huge big white guitar and two other ladies with her. And she was coming in anyway. And the next thing anyway, she walked in, she says, where's the open mic on? We're just doing it down in there. So she sat into the chair with the big white guitar. I, I didn't recognise her. And the next thing, when I heard the voice, then I knew who it was. <laughs> For generations, Sinead O'Connor has held the hands of millions through breakups, first dances, and funerals. But today, they showed up for her in their thousands as they mourned one of their own in the Irish seaside town the singer had once called home. It was here, her family say, that O'Connor spent some of her happiest years living on the seafront in Bray, where we meet an old friend of hers, front man of the band, Hot House Flowers. She stunned me when I first did some work with her. That's beautiful presence, like she, she was the centre of the space she occupied. And um, she had grace and carriage. You no, know, she carried herself very gracefully. And, um, and she was fearsome, like the, you could feel the volcanic energy. Just to say thanks to Sinead for blazing the trail. Yeah. You know, she, she illuminated the path for us all from, from we were young right up until now, you know. Um, and we're just grateful. What kind of, um, what does she do differently that other people? Didn't? She spoke honestly and bravely in a time when it wasn't that common. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just a place that's symbolic of getting together. Because I don't think, yeah, I mean, sure, this was her home, but Sinead was, you know, ethereal homes, which was international, but she was certainly owned by a lot of people. We felt a certain level of ownership of her. So I think it's wonderful. Bray's beautiful. Um, and I'm just thinking of, she must have had a lovely aspect each morning, and I hope it helped her. What do you think is Sinead O'Connor's legacy in Ireland? God, this it's this song and so many others like Queen of Denmark, but yeah, it's this song, you know. Thanks. <laughs> I'm here because we were fans, massive fans of Sinead and she'll be missed. She was an Irish legend and I'm, as an Irish Muslim, I felt that I should be here on behalf of my community to pay my respects to the Irish legend she was. I just think that she was like massively outspoken and she spoke for minorities that didn't have a voice. And that's um, very admirable and very brave, you know? So, yeah, thank you. Well, it's very, very sad that she's gone today. I think also we were trying to articulate how much pain everybody's in. I don't think I've ever cried so much for a stranger, but I think she held bits of generations of this nation in her heart. She was saying things before we could say them, but she held our pain about the institutionalised sexual abuse, the threat of being sent to letter frack or to a Magdalene laundry if you misbehaved. And she held that along with the courage that we weren't able to, to fully live. And so when she died yesterday, it felt like that part of us went with her. At least I think that's what I'm um, feeling, something that feels like a disproportionate grief for someone I didn't know personally. But what I hope it does is lights with absolute fucking fire underneath all of us Absolutely. to change what's happening with mental health and children and the family law courts that's still going through. And uh, government at the moment to restructure how childcare um, and child mental health care is dealt with in Ireland. And the way it is now is not right. And this is an opportunity for everyone to do it as Sinead would and tell them to get their fucking ass together. Yeah. Yeah.
she was just incredible. And I think the love, like I've come up here and love my art, because she gets so much love. And uh, that's what I'm following through and talk to the girls, like the girls need the love. Like she hadn't, shouldn't have to fight for so long for these basic rights and so like, people are doing bad things. There's such an enabler. Thanks, thank you. Maureen, as someone who, who suffered such extreme abuse, just like Shania did, what did it mean for you that she was so vocal and so open? Because it gave us all courage. It gave us all strength. She gave strength to so many women. And I, I, the only thing I feel so sad about was the way she was treated in Ireland. I think that people should have supported her more. Yeah, no, I know we should have looked him after a little bit better. I know she used to come in and see Christine yeah, Buckley quite a lot. Honor, she, she and uh, I think, you know, they're supporting her now as she's dead. But what yeah. support did she get when she was living? Anyway, That's the sad yeah. side of it. So my hope for her is that she's gone into the light. I know, and I hope she's in a better place because she deserves it. She made Ireland a different place. She spoke out when nobody else would do. Sinead is survived by her three children. After her untimely death, Sinead O'Connor leaves an undoubted, fearless musical legacy. With haunting melodies and powerful lyrics, she showed her soul through her music, touching the hearts of those who listened. She fearlessly confronted social issues using her platforms to advocate for the causes she believed in, despite her personal struggles. She never failed to show authenticity and inspiring commitment. Her memory lives on through her music, which will be listened to by generations to follow. <laughs>